to the Novelty Podcast. My name is Alexandra. And I'm Emily. And I like to read from the perspective of your kind of classic English nerdy teacher. Yes. And I sort of phrase it as, I like to talk about what the reader owes the book. And I read more from the perspective of as a writer and an editor, so I'm talking more about what the writer owes the reader. Fantastic. You owe them a lot if they're going to buy your book. That's right. And give you money and time. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so for today we have a really fun topic, which has been sitting in our backlog for a while. This is one that we sort of gripe about on the side, <laughs> just between the two of us. This has been a long-standing complaint of ours, and we were like, okay, yeah. we need to do this topic. And it is when the marketing does not match the book itself. Right. And then, you know, and I think publishing is a really interesting industry because in for lots of the creative arts, obviously marketing and business intersects and sort of taints, if you will, the pure art or the right. pure expression of what we're trying to right. do because there's economic pressures on it. But with the industrial complex <laughs> of the publishing industry, I feel like it happens even more so than maybe some of the other creative Wait, spaces experience. that that might be. Well, I think it's a it's a industry that's more malleable mm-hmm. in a way. And so it's it falls prey to this very easily. Yeah. It's very easy to be like oh, let's identify an existing customer base yeah. and just write for that. It's something that's very, uh, the movies fall prey to. Movie yeah. Co- you know, like, it's it's easier for that to be than like, oh, if you're a painter, you know, the customer base for painting is a little bit more fluid and not, it's yeah. easy to identify. Right. But people buy books that, like, they're very devoted to genres often. Right. And so publishers, traditional publishers especially... But even even self publishing mm-hmm. can fall prey to like instead of writing the book they want to write, yeah, write the book they think the readers will buy, right? And that's not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think as well. Oh, before we go any further, oh dear, what are you drinking today, Emily? Okay, so we violated the novelty podcast standard today, and we both are having a latte. Yeah, we needed a little kick. It, it's sometimes you just need coffee. Yeah, and that's okay. Caffeine is my drug of choice, and I can feel it currently right now making me happy inside my body. Caffeine, for me, it's caffeine with a lot of milk. Mm-hmm. I like me, I like, I like some, some coffee with my milk, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I'm a cafe au lait girl. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, back to the topic at hand. We have to do the interlude, of course. You know, as artists ourselves, obviously we're so on the side of really defending arts, the true impetus, the true creative spark from these other pressures that might come in to influence it or quote unquote corrupt it or taint it or move it in a different direction. And one of my favorite quotes is from Julia Cameron who famously wrote The Artist's Way where she talks about how important it is for artists and this is, she's really writing for writers. I think she was yeah, primarily a writer right. herself, but the book works for all kinds of creative gifts. Right. Actually, one of the early ways that we connected and became friends was over that We book. both had read that book recently. Yeah. And she says, it's important for artists to remember that they create the market and not the other way around. Right. right. And so when publishers or marketing experts kind of come in and give you advice about your work and what you should do, I think it's really important to take it with not a grain of salt, but maybe a, a metric ton of salt because... They may know what's selling today, but they don't know what the audience is going to be interested in two or three years from now when your book is actually going to be published. Well, and also, like, if you really look at, like, books that outstand, even, like, today, you know, not, we're not talking about, like, oh, this book was written, like, 30 years ago and now it's popular. You know, books that even in their own time you know, they're not the people who are writing for a market. Yeah. Like someone like I was talking about, Jeff, I believe it's Jeff Vandermeer, who wrote the what we know as the Annihilation mm-hmm. uh, trilogy. It's actually the Southern Reach trilogy, but people just call it the Annihilation trilogy. I had read an article with him because Annihilation was his first successful book. He had written several books before, but Annihilation was his first success, huge success. Um, and the interviewer was like, well, what do you think made the difference between this book and your last book? And he's like, well, honestly, my first couple of books I wrote, what people I thought people wanted to read, and with Annihilation, I threw that out the window and just got as weird as I felt like getting. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is very, very true to what so often happens in the market. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of books that sell, but the books that are like truly good books yeah. are written by people who are just writing what they want to write. Yeah. So with that in mind. What is the first book that you have brought to the podcast today to talk about for this topic? 
The first book I brought is one that like absolutely enrages me. Um, and it's called The Stuff of Nightmares by James Lovegrove. Um, I'm going to say up front, I'm not going to address this specifically, but I will say up front, I find this book to be highly, highly offensive from a perspective of how it portrays both women and sexual assault mm -hmm. and sexual assault of children. So I'm going to say up front, like, there are very few books where I'm like, don't read this. Um, most of the books are just like, well, I didn't like it, but that's just because it wasn't for me. This is like a don't read this book. <laughs> yeah. book. But I'm not going to address that aspect of it today because there was also, that wasn't the only thing that was wrong with this book. So I had read some like short Sherlock Holmes fan fiction by James Lovegrown. And in the short Sherlock uh, fan fiction, he was just fine. And so I was like, oh, I like some of his short stories. And look, he's written entire Sherlock fan fiction novels. Also, I found out that like the short fiction that he wrote was his most recent stuff. Mm. I went all the way back to his first Sherlock Holmes fan fiction novel. Yeah. I am absolutely the market for Sherlock Holmes fan fiction. I have read a lot of it. It's my like happy place after I've read like a lot of hard books and I go and I calm down with... There are several genres I go to, but Sherlock fan fiction is definitely one of those because it's just very comforting. Yeah. You know, the time period, you know, like, it's just... The detection, the method, yeah, the familiarity pretty, of Sherlock exactly, as a character. Exactly. You know, it's great. So this was sold straight as Sherlock fan fiction. Back matter, nothing about the book said it was anything other than Sherlock fan fiction. I'm going to go on a limb and tell you I know what happened here <laughs> because I feel like I know what happened here. He wanted to write a Transformers book in the Victorian era because steampunk Transformers is what this book actually is about. Yeah. And instead the publishers were like, I don't know if there's a market for that, so let's tap into an existing marketing like group. They mm -hmm. exist. Buyers. There are a lot of buyers for Sherlock fan fiction. It's not like the biggest yeah. genre, but there is a committed fan base for that. Yeah. So they kind of throw Sherlock into this thing. Yeah. And it is on so many levels not a Sherlock Holmes story. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things that you would sort of expect out of a Sherlock Holmes story that you didn't see in this because it's really fundamentally a different type of book? I mean, for one thing, just like the basic problem solving, mm -hmm. this is much more of like an action adventure. Yeah. Um, not in a good way. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying action adventure is wrong, but like this is a poorly done action adventure. But like... There is very little detection. There is yeah. very little, like, Sherlock hunting down. Often it's just Sherlock watching Transformers fight. Okay. Or other people. You know, like, there are other characters that are actually more prominent and more important to the story than Sherlock. Mm -hmm. You you go to Sherlock fan fiction for Sherlock. Right. You know, that's what you want. And, I mean, even a lot of modern fan fiction writers, I think, actually put more Sherlock in than even Arthur Conan Doyle, because that's what people want. Right. And Sherlock... Even to Arthur Conan Doyle's chagrin. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we just love this character. Yeah. We hit, please bring him back from the dead type of character. <laughs> Yeah, um, and Sherlock kind of starts out the novel and then really fades off into the distance. Also, when you're going to a Sherlock fan fiction, there's a certain level of like gross and grittiness and like reality that you're not there for. Yeah. I don't go to Sherlock Holmes to have a plot line about child sexual assault. Right. This is this is my comfort zone. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying that those things shouldn't be written about, we shouldn't address these things. But this is not where Sherlock fan fiction people are going to Sherlock fan fiction for. Yeah. So, you know, whereas I expected, you know, the character of Sherlock, mm -hmm. you know, his classic detection style, the, you know, kind of cleverness and wittiness, mm -hmm. but also like well, the mysteries of Sherlock Holmes are kind of bizarre and funny oh, yeah. and weird, you know, and as entertaining as they, and like, that's just not, there, none of that is there. No atmosphere, nothing. Was Watson there? Yes, um, to fire his gun. <laughs> was Watson the narrator? Because so much of the fun, of course, is Watson's perspective on Sherlock. You know, Watson is the narrator, but at some point, the Chris, the true, I would say, like the true main character mm -hmm. of this story is um, this guy who's building. There's two guys who are building steampunk transformers. One is ostensibly good, and one is the bad guy. And the good builder of steampunk stuff is like the true main character mm -hmm. so even though 
Watson is narrating, at one point it becomes Watson's like, and then he said, and that literally goes on for chapters. This guy totally takes over the narrative. It's all his story. It's all from his perspective, you know, and, and it's very clear what this author wanted to write. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just, like, let me just put it in a frame narrative of Watson and Sherlock. Exactly. They're kind of like the border of the story. And then the meat of it is all of this like silly action adventure slash super dark child sex assault ring story, uh -huh. which again, to me also doesn't mesh because steampunk transformers kind of a silly, funny concept. Right. And you're going to make that, that they're fighting over a underage girl who was raped to death. Like that's what your, that's what your plot Jeez. line is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you read these books and you're like, this person needs to go to therapy. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I read this book and I was like, well, you clearly don't think that well of women. Cause I don't know how you could write this book and say you did. Um, yeah. It was yikes. Yeah. There Big was yikes. So much uncomfortableness about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I too think that like, I mean, it would be interesting to know what the story, I still think it probably would have been very offensive, yeah. but it'd be interesting to know what the, the writing would have been like had he been allowed to just write the novel that he, that he wanted. wanted to. Because at this point, it's very disjointed because you're like, mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's a Sherlock story, except for it's just because Sherlock is here, to yeah. all of a sudden it's not Sherlock, and Sherlock yeah. doesn't even matter, and he's not even here. So the writing itself becomes very disjointed and right. very unfortunate. I mean, okay, this is the level of not Sherlock it is. Yeah. There is a scene where Sherlock and Watson are like in an atrium that's booby-trapped, to drop giant slashes of glass. And instead of Sherlock like solving a mystery, all he's doing is like running away from all these glass shards coming through. Like this is how yeah. out of step this is. Mm -hmm. You know, there are scenes where he's hanging onto the side of a, you know, so steam like, train. You know? It's a Tom Cruise movie. <laughs> yes. It's a Victorian Tom Cruise movie <laughs> slash Transformers. Okay. Because that it. eventually comes out too. Okay. Where the steam engine turns into it's so bad. <laughs> well, it sounds okay. So it sounds like it probably would not have been particularly successful, even if the Sherlock elements weren't there. Yeah. But the Sherlock elements make it worse, and you, the only reason why you read it was because There's it was pitched as the Sherlock story. I find it very hard to believe that anybody who honestly went there because of Sherlock, which is how it's marketed. Yeah. That there's. There's no clue to you on its back matter, on its cover, you know, yeah. anything like that, that it's going to be a not Sherlock story. Right. Um, I can't imagine people who come to really experience Sherlock Holmes being satisfied mm -hmm. with what they got. Yeah. Which is like, in essence, why you shouldn't do this. Right. Because, in, yes, you might initially tap into an existing market. Right. That market's then going to go out there and be like, don't read this book, guys. Yeah. Like, this is... This, this is not right. This is not what we, you know, signed up for. Right. Interesting. Very interesting. Very frustrating. Yeah. I'm still angry about that. I'm like so many levels. First of yeah. all, I just wanted Sherlock. <laughs> yeah. No, there, I think there is a sense of betrayal where, well, because you're putting in your money and your time, as right. we talked about, this really goes to the heart of your favorite topic when we look at these things is what does the author owe the reader? Right. And, you know, when you're setting out a premise or a promise, whether that's a joke, whether that's a cartoon, whether that's a graphic novel, whether that's a full length novel, a right. painting, whatever, there's always the, the premise, the promise that you give and then the fulfillment and the resolution right. and the fulfillment of that can be done in unexpected ways. That's usually where how humor works and on a fundamental right. level anyway, but like you still have to fulfill your promise. Right. Right. Because even if it's like extremely good, like mm -hmm. people came here for a, and if you give them B, then they're going to be sitting there wondering if that's enough to satisfy them. Right. You know, and not for me, like this took it a step further of like, it became truly offensive. And like the character of Sherlock was so unnecessary to the story mm -hmm. that like it became almost like an insult to Sherlock fans. Yeah. Because like, I don't, I'm, this isn't, I clearly came here for Sherlock and you're like, no, 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 you'd much rather have these other characters. And I'm like, no. Yeah. I don't want these other characters. <laughs> yeah. Clearly. Yeah. And also when it's sort of like a, you know, very low effort, low 
correlation to the original character where it's like, well, you obviously slapped that on. Yeah, yeah. And and I think you can feel that in the mm-hmm. writing. Yeah. I think you can feel the lack of enthusiasm mm-hmm. that this author has for the Sherlock mm-hmm. phases of it or in parts of it. Like, mm-hmm. to me, it's clear that, th- that this was an afterthought. Mm-hmm. And it has to be, like, wildly frustrating to him. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I can't imagine you know, what it would be like to be like, here's my baby. And the response would be like, I, I don't like that baby. Yeah. I, I want a Your different baby one. baby looks like a squashed potato. <laughs> <laughs> Your baby's not going to sell to anybody. Nobody wants yeah. that. You know, yeah. I'm sure that that was wildly frustrating. Mm-hmm. And I know I've heard a lot of authors speak about, you know, the frustrations of being in traditional publishing and the pressures they get to make their writing about the market and not about their writing it's honestly a bad choice on the publisher's part yeah you've talked about this before but let me have ask you about it i know you've spoken specifically about the romance genre and the mystery genre right. and how publishing has formed those into failing failing parts industry. Of industry yeah no i mean we went through a period about like 10 years ago maybe a little bit earlier than that um but where some major publishers let go of a fairly large chunk of their mystery writers and the reason being they were like well this isn't selling anymore and we're not going to keep these authors in and like they were getting feedback from readers saying well these stories are boring you know and everyone is the same and so they're like oh well people must not like mysteries anymore let them go and the a lot of authors who lost their contracts came out and were very very open and said we were not allowed to write the mysteries we wanted to write right if we submitted original stories they were rejected and we were told if you want to stay with this house here's the formula you're staying in, Mm -hmm. which they would do for like 20 books and then they would lose their readers because no one wants to read the same book 20 times. Right. You know, and mystery is, I I will agree as as a mystery writer or mystery lover, like I don't read a lot of modern mysteries because they're so formulaic. Mm -hmm. It gets to the place where you're just like, well, why? Why would I read this? You know, and it's, it's a place in which publishers are so blind and so you know, influenced by the concept of, of profit. And again, um, the movie industry is, ex- is almost identical to this, mm-hmm. where they will produce one failure after another mm-hmm. and just ride that into the ground because, right. like, they cannot grasp the concept of taking a chance on something original. We're looking at you, MC Universe. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Guys. We're done. Disney Plus. Oh, my gosh. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> Let that horse... Okay, that horse is dead. Dismount. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Stop beating it. It's just... It's um, time to get off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's other types of books that we see as being sort of like the redheaded stepchild of an original big breakout. So, you know, after the Harry Potter books popped, there's a bunch of sort of hero magic school right. type stories that would came out or after twilight pop there's a bunch of vampire diaries and other secondary versions of these vampire now stories. we have a court of everything and thorns and roses like right. all the books and, the, and uh, you know hunger games and the hunger right. game lookalikes right and um you know the the first to the market you know especially when it's an original work with a lot of passion and a lot of you know creativity behind it it captures the attention of the market because of its merits whether you like any of those books or not they obviously had a creative spark that people resonated right. with um, even if it's tell. not your taste you can tell when yeah. an author is into what they're writing yeah. sometimes they're too into it but you can still tell when right. they are really about what they are writing and yeah. it 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 makes it better honestly yeah. it does yeah which that's not to say that you can't be inspired by other works and incorporate things that you love about certain other works, but right. there still has to be that original spark yeah. that really is the seed and the sh- and the and the core of what you create. I mean, this is honestly why in the last couple of years I've really got into reading self-published books because they are so wild, they are so <laughs> out there. I mean, I, I'm going to admit they're not always like the best book in the world, but I'm so desperate for originality at this point. I'm like, yeah. I don't care. I love. How completely unhinged and out there and how yeah. experimental some of this stuff is. I would much rather read that yeah. than like the 14th version of Gone Girl. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I've started by, also by contrast, I've started reading a lot more fiction that's coming out of Japan and China and Korea. Mm-hmm. And these are like very well-known books in their own market and for people who typically read from those cultures. But because I was so locked into reading British and American literature right. and classics for so long, they feel so fresh right. yeah. and so interesting and yeah. so exciting to read. And so, you know, 
You just got to mix it up sometimes. Sometimes, I mean, what you, I, I feel like if you don't, it's so easy to fall into a stage of like, oh, I guess I don't really like reading anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of burnt out on reading. Are you burnt out on reading? Are you burnt out on reading the same book over and over again? Which is so easy to do. Right. You can, if you like book A, you can do book A.1 yeah. and point two and point three. I mean, if you... I don't know if you've been into like Barnes and Nobles recently and seen like the tables they have for different genres and there's like 15 books on there. They're all different authors. They're exact same cover. And the, well, <laughs> and the other thing that you get is like these weird, really like micro genres, I would call them where it's like, you know, a romance specifically in the style of Colleen Hoover or something yes, like that, yeah. where it's like, you know, a really messed up abusive relationship is at the core of what you're dealing with, but it's modern. I mean, I haven't read Colleen Hoover. I've just heard people talk about it. So right. maybe she writes other stuff too. Um, but that's kind of her like most popular novels. Right. Or you'll see like a stack of books where it's like, like you said, all of the gone girlification of yeah. like, it's like, it's not just a thriller. It's a thriller with a female protagonist who's like surveilling her neighborhood or her world or, and is taking revenge against the patriarchy in some, some twisted way, way. Yeah. you know? And it's like, that's a really neat micro <laughs> I know and I don't when people talk about like oh there's you know most writers don't support themselves they only sell like you know a couple of thousand copies it's very common for you just to like put out a bunch of books yeah. and not sell that much well yeah like at some point your readers like well I've read that book 14 times before so why would yeah. I read it 15 times just because you put out that book right you know so this is a trap mm -hmm. that publishers fall into authors fall into thinking that like Oh, this market exists. Mm -hmm. So if I write to this market, my book will sell. Yeah. And oftentimes that market is saturated. Yeah. That market is, there's too and, much. And particularly, like I said, by the time you get to year three, when your book is actually coming out, if you were talking about that market three years ago, it's going to be mega saturated by the time you're actually fulfilling. And that doesn't mean that like, oh, I want to write Sherlock fan fiction and the market is saturated. So I shouldn't. Yeah. But like, try to find an original way to get there. Like right. honestly examine yourself and your writing. You know, if you're if you're writing the next alien romance, I'm not saying don't do that because that's really popular. But like are you writing the next alien romance or are you writing like 2.0 of the current most popular one? Right. Like honestly and truly examine, you know, and find ways to stand out too. Mm -hmm. Like your cover does not... I know with traditional publishing, you don't have a lot of right. options. You are stuck with what you are stuck with. Right. But I see like self-published authors getting into the mode of like naming their naming their books almost a court of thorns and roses. Or court of thorns. What is it? Thorns and roses. So right. that one. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. naming their text a almost this, a this, that. And this. Yeah. <laughs> or having the exact same covers as you know you see in Barnes Nobles. And it's like stand out. It's okay. Yeah. Like be yourself. No one's mm -hmm. here telling you, you have to be like this. Yeah. And to people going, you know, trying to decide between self-publishing and traditional, consider that yeah. because tr traditional publishing is a very difficult space to be in mm -hmm. where they can tell you like, Oh, your baby's ugly, but yeah. you know, put a deer stalker on it and we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the, and on the flip side, that's not to say that if you come out with your passion work and your original work that you're guaranteed success. No. None of us are in this world. That's not the but, way arts works. But also it's like, well, at least you didn't compromise your artistic vision right. in the process. At so least at you least did you, what you, what fulfills you. Exactly. And there is a level where, like, yes, we'd all like to make a living off of our art or at least have people acknowledge that it's out there. Right. But if you're making a living just reproducing art, like, yeah. at what point does that actually become detrimental to you as mm -hmm. an individual? Because I can tell you, like, reading these statements, that all these mystery writers who you know were let go of their contract mm -hmm. they were bitter on the inside they well, were so upset because they like yeah. they felt so repressed and mm -hmm. had felt so for so long like mm -hmm. yeah ostensibly they were living the dream for a, quite some time of you know mm -hmm. making a living as an author but it wasn't a dream yeah well and I think like if I get burned out reading these how much do they get burnt out writing them? exactly yeah I mean, I wouldn't be able to do it. I mean, even like, even if you read Agatha Christie and her later stories, mm -hmm. you know, like she was basically told you will write a Hercule Poirot yeah. every single year. Yeah. Basically for your, until you're dead. Yeah. You a know, Christmas or Christie for Christmas. Yeah, exactly. And so, but she got very, very tired of the character of Poirot. And I honestly appreciated that she started making him a side character. Yeah. And 
coped with it instead of forcing herself to write his character over Mm -hmm. and over again and getting frustrated and writing bad books. Right. She found a way to sidestep that where there it's actually someone else's story and they just occasionally visit Poirot's office and he's sitting there and and, you know he doesn't engage much Mm -hmm. in the story and that was her way of coping with it and I think that's a far better way of coping with it than being like I guess I'll just write the same book again because that's what the publisher wants you know. Right. Right. Okay so my book. Let's talk about (laughs) <laughs> your frustrating experience. I yeah. don't feel as you're as this is like this is this is more disappointment than rage. But then that actually yeah. is our personality. So <laughs> That's true. I would probably feel rage in your in your case. Yeah. Well, and I also feel like you know for the steampunk uh, transformers, it seems like. There are many other problems with the book. There are. And yeah. it probably would have been a bad book, even if... Yeah. <laughs> you know, it would have been bad yeah. anyway. This book, I'm disappointed because there's so many good elements about it. Mm. So I'm actually going to talk about a book that's very highly acclaimed and is popular with a lot of people, and that's Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. Right. And under this topic, it's probably very clear to people why I'm talking about it, because it's billed as a story that's primarily about William Shakespeare and his relationship to his son, Hamnet a.k.a. also Hamlet, which is the inspiration for the play Hamlet. It's this huge, important component of Shakespeare's life. It was the impetus for that play, which is one of the most important Shakespeare plays. Right, right. You know, it's just this really fascinating story about his relationship with his son who died from the plague and his own examination of relationships between sons and fathers and death and the ghost of the king. I mean, it's just this very rich topic that a lot of scholars have written about. Honestly, the idea of like what an author's environment, how that affects what they write, I think is a fascinating topic. Right. And I think, and I will say, Maggie O'Farrell is probably one of the better writers that I've read recently who's publishing today. Amazing prose, truly a craftsman of her, Mm -hmm. of her work. She really does write beautifully. And she was, uh, just, nominated, I think, shortlisted for Women's Fiction Prize for The Perfect Marriage, and I'm not surprised because what I saw in that book is really phenomenal writing. The story that I think was in Maggie's heart, if I may potentially project onto her, I don't know if this is true, but it's clear to me from reading the book that the character she was interested in is Shakespeare's wife. Also fascinating, Shakespeare's wife was an accused witch during her day. She was much older than Shakespeare. Right. Um, and then they got married, and she kind of, you know, fades into the background a little bit because obviously... As I understand, we don't actually know that much exactly. about her. And those are kind of like the little tidbits that we know about her. And it's very clear to me that Maggie O'Farrell had this vision of this character who is witchy, in tune with nature, in tune with animals. Um, and, you know, what does she do in this sort of early renaissance 1600s 1590s society in the midst of the plagues that are happening so what is that what does the plague do for a character like that right that it needed to be shakespeare's wife i don't actually even know that but it was clear that she had this witch character in mind that she wanted to explore she found out that shakespeare's wife was a witch shakespeare's name gets attached to it and i could see why the marketers would say, oh, we need to run with William Shakespeare first, right. and even William Shakespeare plus Hamlet slash Hamnet, and put that center stage. Let me tell you, that is so far to the side yeah. of this book. That is like, it's not even relevant. That, that goes back to like, oh, this concept of an existing market. Right. Because like, honestly, there's more of a market for lovers of Shakespeare and yeah. lovers of Hamlet than there are witchies. Yeah. You know, like that's just witchy stuff is a market but it's very niche and mm-hmm. it's a small niche so like I can understand being and a publisher being like Shakespeare how yeah. about that and especially for someone who writes more of a literary fiction style if you're doing a genre fiction style of a genre fantasy of sort of a dark witch there's much more of a market for it but that's just not Maggie O'Farrell's style she's very literary yeah I mean it's not really it's a it's a, a sub niche that I feel like is much more fun and cute mm-hmm. and quirky yeah I see out there and not really a literary style that you're talking about right and I just was really disappointed because of course I came in with the expectation of the story that I was very right. excitedly telling yeah. like the Hamlet and Hamnet and <laughs> Shakespeare and the influence on the play you know I'm that's very, why I'm here exactly and I was like completely sold and that is a fascinating story and I do think that the core of the story that Maggie O'Farrell had would have also been good and I possibly would have been interested in that too but it was now hung with all of this baggage of my expectations right. you of came Sherlock. in Sh- wanting Sherlock <laughs> we both have men in our lives yeah. <laughs> and and I think 
the witchy side of this narrative was worse because it was trying to do the Sherlock thing, or <laughs> again, Shakespeare, Shakespeare thing. So the death of Hamnet is sort of like the impetus act or the initial act of like the book, but it also switches timelines. So we're also like going back and forth and finding like Sherlock when you Sherlock <laughs> oh, Shakespeare when he first meets his wife and when they're a young couple and then like now that he's like a, a working playwright and stage actor and he's traveling back and forth to London and then the plague's out and then he gets the word and blah blah blah. And so there's this very slow and extremely drawn out like frame narrative of like Hamnet getting sick or his sister first his sister gets sick and I mean it's like chapters that this is spread oh. and then it because it's switching in timelines it's, it's really spread out fairly long book isn't it no it's really not it's oh very, it's not yeah oh, oh dear <laughs> and so but it just felt long you know what I mean um and so like again because my expectation is I'm getting trying to get to the point where Shakespeare is processing his grief for his son through writing the play Hamlet and the connection to the play Hamlet to this experience right. and I'm like halfway through the book and Hamnet's like I'm feeling a little feverish <laughs> you know and I'm like wait <laughs> this isn't voting well this isn't going well you know <laughs> oh no dad <laughs> you know so that's another thing is like because the it's this use of this frame narrative to kind of put a bow around something where the core is something that's fundamentally different. It's more like, the peripheral. Yeah, it becomes the peripheral in the same way that your Sherlock story was. And um, it also just like, it just hangs so much heavy baggage on the work. Right. Because like, even if it is a good work, you come to it with an expectation. Right. And there's like, I know that you're supposed to not do that with art. You're supposed to come in cold, but that's not reality, especially when you're being marketed to. And I'm a consumer and I paid money for it. Yeah. And I didn't. I mean, I... I'll be honest with you guys, I don't frequently shop at Barnes & Noble. I do use my library heavily, and when I do buy books, I'm usually buying them as used books. And I went to Barnes & Noble, was treating myself, and I got this <laughs> brand new off one of their little tabley tops. So I spent like eleven ninety nine on this very thin, although it's very pretty, paperback book. Which, like, can we talk about how paperback books are like freaking $17 now it's ridiculous I know, I know yeah I used to like buying hard copies to hardbacks because I just like the you know feel of it and that sort of thing and I'm just like and they look I gorgeous can't. Yeah. I know I know and I'm just like I just can't I can't I just, spend $32 on, on a book I just it's I've had to let that go <laughs> yeah so not only did I was I in this mood of like oh I'm gonna get myself something special and do something that I don't normally do then I get a book that I'm disappointed with yeah yeah and I think that that is the risk that uh, any publisher who takes that chance and tries to market to an a, a audience that doesn't actually isn't mm -hmm. actually going to connect, and I feel like the 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 idea is always like, well, they'll go in and they'll like it anyway, mm -hmm. and it's like, well, I mean, the case you're talking about. It's not that the book was bad. Yeah. It's just that you've set up the expectation. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm here for. And I can't, you can't ask me to just be like, never mind. Yeah. I'm, I can just, I can move past this. Yeah. It's like if you went to a restaurant and you ordered spaghetti and they came out with a plate of nachos. It's like, I like nachos. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a criminal. Okay. But I ordered spaghetti because that's what I wanted. And, and you're not going to be like, oh, well, you'll enjoy it. Like, what? No. You know, and so there is that consumer relationship to the product and to the work itself. Yeah. Where I'm like, okay, well, I think I'm, I think I deserve to get what I think I'm paying for. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I think, too high of a risk mm -hmm. to go for. Yeah. You, you can, I, I, I know that there are times when it works out, but I think that more often than not, you mm -hmm. are run, you're running too high of a risk of actually frustrating your reader. And the, the, on the flip side is, even though I can see what a great writer Maggie O'Farrell is, and even though her next book came out and it sounds really interesting and it's been nominated for multiple awards and shortlisted for multiple awards, I haven't taken the time to check it out or read it or you know, I've heard multiple people right. talk about it and it's because I'm a little gun shot. Yeah. Yeah. And so now it's affected my relationship with her future work. Right. Right. You can't, she's not trustworthy. Yeah. <laughs> and it's probably not even her fault. I could see, I can definitely see why it, there may have been, and maybe she came up with the idea herself because she wanted to write about Shakespeare's wife and she felt that this was the way through. But it also very well could have been that the publisher said, no, you have to put Shakespeare first right. on this. Exactly. You have to make that your framework because mm -hmm. 
that there's a market there. Yeah. That is, and that is, I totally understand. Like when you write a book proposal, yeah. part of that book proposal is like, why are people going to buy this? Right. You know, what's your market? Who, who are you selling to? Yeah. And if you're kind of out there and <laughs> yeah. you can't exactly identify that, like, and you want a traditional publisher, well, forget that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I read also a book called Manning Tree Witches that had come out a few years um, earlier. And that one is literary fiction also about a witch scenario, more of like a Salem witch type of scenario. So it's a little bit later. Um, but it was, it had done quite well and I could imagine them being like, no, we just did a book like this. Like there's not mm. enough room in the market. This is too specific. You're going to have a very to go small in, niche. Yeah. yeah. Go in a different direction. So I don't know. And this is me just kind of speculating. Of course I have yeah, no we're, idea. Yeah. We're just, we're doing our best to guess, but we are guessing on Things that are known, yeah. like we know that publishers do this right. and that it's very difficult for writers. Honestly, I would assume it would be difficult to write through as someone who mm -hmm. does write. Like I don't enjoy writing stories that I don't enjoy. Yeah. And so I, you know, I can always like, I feel like no, when an author, like, like I was talking about the case of Agatha Christie, like, yeah. Even though I feel like those stories are still successful, I can totally tell that she's done with Faro and she doesn't yeah. care about him. Like, it's super obvious. Like, you yeah. can feel that. And I feel like you can feel in when you're writing something or reading something, you can feel when the author's like, damn, I have to put this in. So, can you just endure this chapter to make my publisher happy? Right. You know, <laughs> like We're that all comes here off. Placating the publisher for whatever reason. Yeah. Whereas, like, you know, a book like, I would say an example of like Annihilation, you were just all in that mm -hmm. like that is a consuming book and there's never a moment where i'm just like oh the publisher probably wanted that here <laughs> yeah no no that book's real weird <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and fantastic for yes. being weird 100 percent. okay so let's tip, go to a lighter note so tell I, us about your third book i have a third book that like uh if I'm like in a bad mood, I think about this book just to make myself laugh. <laughs> and this was actually a moment where the book was marketed wrong, but it turned out okay for me. What makes me laugh is there have got to be people out there that this did not go okay for. <laughs> I'm going to out myself here. I do enjoy alien romance and sci-fi romance. I read a lot of like heavy depressing books about World War II and then I burn out and I'm like, I need to go someplace where there's no thought involved. Yeah. You know? You, and you also... You know, sometimes you just want to read that. You know, and, you know, for me, also, like, usually, like, chintzy romance mm -hmm. novels are kind of relaxing because they do kind of have, like, you know, specific yeah. plot lines, which is, like, why we like mystery because... I mean, these genre fiction... They have... They have their framework. They have their tropes. We know the pacing that they're going to go through. Right. So you can know, like, okay... I mean, which is, like, why I go to Sherlock mm -hmm. sometimes for those comforts because there is a framework. I know it's going to happen. I know I'm not going to encounter anything, like, you know... You think you know that you're not going to... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, that's why we, we go back to these genres. Like, why we consider them to be comforting. And why I know, like, I'm sure a lot of people went to this book expecting this. So I'm also, like, pretty open to just trying anything that's in my, like, included with your Audible membership because, yeah. you know, that's how I find new authors. Like, I'm not, I'm not taking any risks, right? Right. Well, let me pause you there and plug you a little bit because you do mini reviews on your TikTok. I do. And people get to watch you do <laughs> digital art and you talk about your experiences with some of these Audible books. Yeah. Just so what's your handle for that if people want to follow you there? I'm Snow White Rose red as uh -huh. in uh, r-e-a-d yeah <laughs> so you can find her there if you want mini reviews of mini reviews books. of of audible original like test runs which sometimes go great <laughs> and, and sometimes, sometimes do not make me so angry <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but i mean that's one of the biggest like benefits to me for having an audible membership mm -hmm. is i can take risks yeah it's really hard to take risks if you're paying for 17 dollars for a exactly. paperback book you're just not going to do it but if Hence i can... might rage over hamnet well and for me it's the same thing about reading physical books yeah i'm putting in time that i don't have a lot of to sit yeah. down so audible books to me are like like there's no risk in this. I can try yeah. an author that I'm not paying any extra for mm -hmm. and I'm just doing it while I'm cooking dinner and I was going to be reading something while I was cooking dinner anyway, you right. know. So very low risk. So I'm very willing to just push play on things. Yeah. Um, so Audible's like, hey, I know you like romance. So here's a book that's a romance. And I, I checked the genre. It is listed only as a romance. It's an alien romance, you can tell. But the cover is the characters hugging. 
Okay? Like, yeah, they're in an embrace. Yeah, they're just like, hugging. You, it, yeah. it could be Fabio <laughs> embracing. It's that classic cover. Yeah, exactly. There's there's nothing about it that says anything other than we're, romance. Well, how big were the pectoral muscles of the alien creature? This is a key yeah, question. Yeah. Well, he actually only got his back. Oh. But well, he had nice broad shoulders. Okay. So. That's... See, it's a romance. <laughs> yeah. How could it be anything else? Yeah. You know what? You're just going to sit back and... I mean, like... And I've heard, like... Because I read a lot of romance... I, I like, I'm just a genre reader. I like read all the genres. And so but I know like people in these different communities, we, we do this to like, okay, I need like something to listen to while I'm trying to fall asleep, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, totally. I need to explain something about romance. Mm-hmm. Romance does not mean there is a romance plot. That means it is the plot. <laughs> right. It's not the subplot. It's not a secondary plot. It's not the char- There are characters who fall in love in the plot. <laughs> yeah. It, that should be the plot. So... We're sidestepping from that there. It's just listed as a romance. It's, I would not even, okay, there's a classification that's called sci-fi romance. Right. And that means it's a romance plot. In a sci-fi, sci-fi setting. setting. There's, we are aware of what yeah. this means. There's also what we call hard science fiction. Right. And hard science fiction is when your plot line is like true science fiction. Which like the purpose of science fiction is really to examine humanity's relationship with technology, right. which again doesn't mean that there can't be characters who fall, fall in love, love, but that's not the point of the book. Right, exactly. So, the plot line of this only romance novel <laughs> is like humanity has made contact with one alien race, and they. Yeah, they have. <laughs> not that alien race. Oh. We're, we'll get there. <laughs> One alien race that's kind of like a fish people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they sound very unattractive. They're not, the, it's not the guy with the brad bag. No, okay. no, there's no brad I'm bag. I'm already getting disappointed. <laughs> Go ahead. And there's like this linguistics scientist who is part of a team that has helped develop like communication, mm-hmm. you know, with this. And so that's how we're all setting up. And then the military contactor and like, Hey, we've actually made contact with more than just this one alien race, Mm -hmm. but we feel like a lot of them are hostile. And so, you know, we want to like, have you help us contact them before we start a war. What they actually mean is we have like this jail and we've like captured a lot of these people and we're holding them hostage and we want you. That might be why they're hostile. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But like, we're, you know, trying to figure out these different, you know, alien races to find out which ones we need to like mount campaigns against. There's no, like, this is, like, we haven't even met, like, the broad shoulder guy yet. Like, this is all before. She's meeting all of these military guys, and, like, there's clearly something going on with the scientists at this base, because there's, like, the head guy who's never seen, and, like, so, so so much much hard science fiction. It's fantastic, hard science fiction, Uh but it's hard science fiction. With, like, an intrigue plot. Exactly. Like, there's... Like, it's, like, it's political, which science fiction can also do, especially when you're encountering other cultures and that sort of thing. This is, like, a government spy thriller sci-fi. Exactly. And you're just, like, it's obviously, like, very uh, judgmental of, like, a militaristic approach to, you know, reaching out to other species. There's a lot of commentary on that. Okay. Anti-imperialist. Okay. Exactly. There's a lot of that. And, you know, this This is the plot yeah. of this book, right? <laughs> what makes me so entertained about this is, like, there is a point where it goes from hard science fiction to hard science fiction horror. Oh. Like, straight <laughs> horror. <laughs> There's one scene where this starts, which I just, like, enjoy thinking about, like, the, the, rock, the, the romance, romance reader, reader just being thing. like, when is the hot <laughs> alien with the magic D coming okay, in? Right. We're this, like, character that you know, like, okay, we finally meet the guy, the broad shoulder guy. Yeah. You know, who also has a tail. Because that's a thing. Well, <laughs> you know, you party in the front, party in the back. Yeah, exactly. And they're, like, trying to introduce him to, like, other species to see how he reacts. Because uh-huh. it's all science here. We're yeah. observing this. And so they, like, drop a little chimp into his, you know, prison cell. And he, like, rips this chip to piece, uh, chimp to pieces in, like, all gory. And I'm just like, um, do you know who you've marketed this to? <laughs> <laughs> These are people who, like are here for the, the chill <laughs> and the a, love. A little bit of love and a little bit I, of spice. I mean, the further this goes on, yeah. you have, like, outrageous monsters running around the space station literally shredding people. You have people feeding themselves to, like, spider monsters to avoid being taken over by a zombie plague. Like, this book is, is so... I 
loved this book. I thought it was fantastic because it's so over the top and so crazy and has like so much of the science fiction that if you like grew up in like the 90s watching yeah. like Independence Day, yeah. like this is like, I, I read a lot of reviewers say, and I completely agree with this, this is like reading a popcorn flick. Yeah. Like it's just, it's, but the entire time I'm just thinking about. So was how there, <laughs> was there a kissing scene? Oh, there is one spicy scene okay. for sure. And like. The main scientist lady and the broad-shouldered alien dude do run off together at the end. But like the plot line is them escaping this, you know, thing together and so the, fighting so off. So what you're telling me is the romance happens after the book ends, <laughs> there, okay, more or less. There's a spice scene dead in the center, which actually is like a little bit like why jarring. Why are you, this? Is this really a good time? <laughs> I mean, like. There are, there are like murder monsters yeah. on the loose. I think that a lot with like action flicks where it's like the couple is clear. It's like you survived like nuclear war and a train crash. And now they're like giving googly eyes to each other. And I'm like, I feel like you would be in shock. I like, feel like you'd be pretty over. upset. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know if, if I would be in the mood if I just like was like, oh, I'm the one survivor of a plane crash. Yeah. You know? Honestly, like. If there was no spiciness at all, yeah. it still would be a great book because it's really the adventure of these like two people like coming to realize something really bad is going on here and we need to get out before right. we all die. And then it becomes like, you know, half of the space station is trying to escape the monsters and the other half is trying to stop them because they don't want news to get out of what's going on here. Yeah. You know, so it's like becomes like this war scene and it's, it's just like... I, I did honestly, truly enjoy okay. this book, but I also read hard science fiction. And you like a good horror. And I like a good horror. So it's like not, it wasn't like offensive to me because it, it really did fulfill the science fiction horror, like, like, like Some loving things thing. that you enjoy. Yeah. yeah. But if you don't. Because I, honestly, there's not a lot of crossover <laughs> yeah. between romance and like monster fiction. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So then, well, let me ask you this. For this work, we've done a lot of sort of extrapolating and maybe conjecture around why it was marketed the way that it was. But this seems like a very genre, like it would have been successful had it been marketed in its own genre. I kind of wonder if it's not marketed as hard science fiction because there's been so much pushback recently against female writers writing hard science fiction. Okay, I was going to ask, was it a female author? It was a female author, yes. And... I know that even people who write like true science fiction romance mm -hmm. have gotten like flack on the internet and people being very, well, okay, men being very bullying to them mm -hmm. just because they happen to put their romance in a science fiction setting. Mm -hmm. And like, I actually know one writer who's like, I actually call myself like a sci-fi writer because I find that people yell at me less than if I say I'm a science fiction writer. Right. And I, I totally understand being like, I just don't want to be bullied. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to yeah. get the comments of like, you can't write science fiction because you're yeah, or having to put a pen name on it or something. Yeah, like exactly. So to me, what I'm thinking is like this writer didn't want to deal with that and mm -hmm. didn't feel like she could write hard science fiction horror and be accepted mm -hmm. as a writer of her because she's a female and she yeah. didn't want to go on. I mean, a lot, a lot of times women write under just initials when they're going into these genres right? because it, it is weirdly aggressive behavior towards yeah. female writers who write science fiction and write horror or right. like a combination of them. Right. It's just like this weird acceptance I feel like it. it's like this last gasp of misogyny though. Yeah. Because like, I feel like that used to be how it was for fantasy, but too bad. <laughs> and I feel like they're like clinging to this last shred of sci-fi and they're like, you can't have this. And I mean, also they too bad. <laughs> yeah. Like they, they told, this was like the most classic science fiction, but also like satisfying. Yeah. Like there was, I wasn't feeling like, you know, escape from the whatever mm -hmm. is classic science fiction. Right. You know, but at the same time, like I wasn't feeling like yeah. I'm watching the same thing over and over again because there's I mean, this yeah. is again, I, I'm pretty sure this was a self-published book because it is so wild and out of control. And that's something you really only get with, with yeah. self-published fiction these days. That is my guess. Obviously, yeah. I don't know. But my guess is because yeah. she's a female writer, she put a, a spicy scene in the middle and called it romance. Yeah. There was one review on this book that was literally like, Oh my God, I don't read books like this. What? How did this happen? Can I return this? <laughs> and I'm like... That's, I, that's I, the person that's that I was the, thinking yeah. of as I was enjoying this. <laughs> it was, 
I still, I've read many books by that author now because I find you to be a pretty good science fiction writer, but I do know I'm going in. I'm reading science fiction. <laughs> right. Okay, so since this has been sort of like a publishing heavy focused episode, I'm going to ask you to put your editor's cap Okay. We're fully on. on. What are some of the changes that you would make either to the front matter or the back matter of the book or even the content of the books that you talked about today that you think would have made them more successful? Well, for the science fiction one, I think, I mean, starting by like, if you can only, I don't know how many genres you can list on Audible your book is. I think it would have been more honest to, to list it as science fiction. Right. That's, I think, straight up. I don't think that like, like, I feel the the romance plot, I think, is important. I don't think there needed to be a spice scene in the middle of it because, like, I don't think that makes sense in the middle of this book. But also, like, it's not central. Like, if, if you just knew the characters got together at the end, that would have been just as satisfying. Right. And you do feel like that's kind of just the author being in service to the genre that she's, she's telling pe people she's a part yeah. of, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, fine, whatever. But I don't think it really... It didn't detriment the book in it significant way right. the way that Sherlock did right um but, but it, it was like the thing that she needed to hang her hat on to be able to call it a yeah romance. exactly you know and and I think like she needs to know that she can stand on her own as a science fiction writer yeah because I feel like she's a perfectly you know legitimate science fiction writer mm -hmm. I think the cover needed to be different yeah because <laughs> the cover said let's romance. give hugs <laughs> yeah and maybe a little bit more <laughs> Maybe some very intimate hugs. Yeah, exactly. I think that there, there was marketing there that to be like, you, you probably should have been a little bit more fair mm -hmm. to the person who's going to click download on this. Um, and say, oh my gosh, I never write, read stuff like this. <laughs> ah! <laughs> there was a very panicky tone in that. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, did you just hit the chimp scene? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think that, you know, like, I I don't think that that's a book that, like, needed radical changes, but a different cover, yeah. you know, a different focus of, like, a slight teaking of the back matter, yeah. and definitely a different genre, and I feel would have been very like, fair. I think it's totally fair for female writers who are facing harassment in the sci-fi space if she wanted to do a pen name or just right. do initials as a way, as a better way to, to sort of escape that. that pressure if she felt like that's what she you know, was a motivation behind it. Yeah. Like, that's totally legitimate. I think maybe changing your name at this stage in the world is, like, a little bit better compromise than trying to change your book, you right. know? Write the book you want to write. Yeah. At this point, write the book you want to write. And and I understand not wanting the harassment yeah. because I've heard authors talk about that. Totally. And no matter how much they really want to stand by their work, it's still very discouraging. Right. It's not a pleasant thing to deal with. Right. You know, so like I would say I would just, if I didn't want to deal with that, I would just accept that my initials are just fine, you yeah. know, you know, or choosing a, like a gender neutral yeah. ni pen name, right. you know, I think that probably would have been better. And I feel like she might've been more fulfilled as a person to just be like, nope, I'm a sci-fi like, writer. I like me some monster movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For the Sherlock one, um, there seems like there's a lot to be fixed. There. There's there is much to be fixed. I mean, I on a moral level, like I don't think that that author deserves to write. <laughs> I think that you need yeah, to go it, to some educational. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, presuming we could get this guy all the therapy in, in the world. world. Yeah. yeah, no, but is there a a core story there with the steampunk transformers that could be written if we got rid of the misogyny? And the, yeah, I think. Um, I mean, like steampunk is a very fun genre. I have yeah. not read very much in that genre because I, I don't feel like there is like a wide. Mm -hmm. a, vast number of writers in that genre at yeah. this moment. Like, it's very iffy mm -hmm. type of thing. I just haven't read a lot. But, I mean, that can be a very cool world. Mm -hmm. It needs to be an alternate reality. Yeah. Because he was trying to put this into real, real life. life. And that yeah. absolutely does not work. Okay. It needs to be an alternate. Because that, that, like, undercut it for me on my own. I'm like, you really think... That if people, like, in the English countryside saw these, like, monster robots walking around, that that wouldn't change human history. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, and that's okay. Just accept it for what it is. Yeah, an alternate reality is very acceptable in yeah. this day and age. That's totally fine. Yeah. So it definitely it needed to be an alternate reality. And, like, honestly, it needed... And this might have been something that, that lost because it was trying to fit Sherlock and Watson in. It needed a much more robust cast of characters. Mm -hmm. 
because they're really so few characters. There are only three females in the entire story, and they're all victims or something. There's like that. where we have none of like two of them don't have any voice. One's mute. One we never hear from her. She's dead before we ever hear from her. And the other one is just a straight up villain. And they all die. Yeah, all die. Yeah, like dude. <laughs> so like, it needed a far more robust and balanced character system. Yeah, it needed a alternate reality to like make it somewhat believable. Yeah, you know, I don't know what his like, because there's like this plot line that like establishes the villain is the villain, and it's just like, was that your original idea, or are you trying to fit this into Sherlock? Because mm-hmm. I'm kind of <laughs> I don't why is the villain doing this yeah. <laughs> oh he wants to take over the world was that your actual plot line yeah <laughs> so he wants to take over the world <laughs> and he's gonna start with England because everyone starts with England what were you going after England or was just because of Sherlock I don't know yeah there's just yeah that one I feel like I don't it's so hard to identify what the original intent was. Like yeah. I can, I can feel like I can identify what the original like basic plot line was, mm-hmm. but I feel like so much was lost to the attempt to make yeah. it a Sherlock book. That you know, I would be interested, not that interested, but a little bit interested to know like what was your original book pitch that yeah. clearly got shot down. Yeah. You know, like what what were you originally going to go for? Because this is a hub. Yeah. This is some burning garbage right now. (laughs) Yeah. How about you? I think if I were the editor of Hamnet and if I got that manuscript, I, there's a couple of really key changes that I would make, which is I would say like, are you wanting to write about a witch in the 1600s? or Are you wanting to write about Shakespeare's wife and really clarify that with her? Because I think that there's room for it to be Shakespeare's wife and it could be about their relationship rather than Shakespeare and his son. And and that's totally marketable too. Mm-hmm. And you wouldn't necessarily feel like, oh, you got a different book than what you were pitched. Right, right. The other thing that I would do that I think the book was really hamstrung by was these time sh- shifts, these time period shifts. So the flashbacks and the flash forwards. She already had like really great plot, really great. Ca- uh, well, I don't know. The plot was okay. Um, <laughs> the plot was very much hamstrung by these time shifts. So it's hard for me to say. Uh, but the characterization was great gorgeous prose, really interesting idea, and obviously a character that she loved writing about. So I would say just do that and do it, write it as a straight narrative. And this is what I would say for any writer who's wanting to do time period shifts, is write it in order first, mm. and then decide yes. what the shifts should be and make sure that once you've chosen to break up the story in that way, you are not, by doing so, interrupting the motivation and right. movement forward because that's a very hard to maintain that movement forward up when you're being that like broken yeah it's a I very tough technique and excellent advice especially for i mean you know especially for n- new writers but i think any writer if you are going to do kind of a non-traditional narrative start by making it a traditional narrative so you ensure that it that because i feel like a lot of times we like people mm-hmm. write non-traditional narratives without even thinking through like does this actually work right and and you know especially with non-traditional timelines Mm -hmm. um and it really really does help establish like a more a more like sensical timeline Mm -hmm. if you ensure that first of all it works as like a time from front to back yeah yeah so those would be like my things that i would like if maggie o'farrell sat down with me and I could like talk to her about the book. That's, Let's have a be, discussion about those, what happened here. Yes. <laughs> those would be the things that I would, you know, if I were like, you know, uh, who is, I wonder who the editor was for To Kill a Mockingbird and they came with Go Set a Watchman and it's like, here, let's have a conversation about where I, this book needs to go. I read a book once about the writing. Well, part of it was about the writing of that book. And to be honest, like, I feel like the editor should have been a co-author listed yeah. on that. Like they were incredibly influential yeah. on where that ended up. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, that's how, kind of how I would feel about Maggie O'Farrell's like, look, you're so good. You're so good. Like, don't be distracted by these other things that aren't really what you're trying to do. Yeah. It's really, yeah. I, I would really want to refine it and get rid of the craft for her because like the potential is just like gorgeous. I just see it so clearly. And honestly, like, I know if like your problem is that you are in a traditional publisher situation yeah and you know they're not allowing you to do this thing it is totally fine to be both a traditional and Mm self-published writer there are a lot of writers who have book a with 
a traditional publisher because it worked for traditional publishing. And then they came in with book B and the traditional publishers were like, let's rip that to pieces. And they're like, no, because no. I have another option. I can go self-publish it. Right. It's important for me to maintain integrity. Yeah. And that's totally fine. There are a lot of authors now who maintain both types of publishing at the same time. Right. Because the publisher is not going to be like, whoa, we're never publishing with you again. You can just yeah. be like, I'll submit my next book proposal to you and we'll see if we can work on that project. Right. You know, it's totally acceptable. So if you have a book that is meaningful to you and you want to, you have a publisher and they refuse to let you have, there's nothing wrong with saying like, you know what, on this piece, I'm going to re retain, you mm -hmm. know, my original vision. Yeah. And I know that's super scary if you are in traditional publishing, if you've always been in, you or you want that prestige, like that is super scary. So you just have to like ask yourself what you really are willing to sacrifice because mm -hmm. In some way, you're being asked to sacrifice your integrity. Mm -hmm. If you're being asked to like, you know, okay, you don't have the cover you wanted, or, you know, yeah. maybe your title's a bit, you know, not what you wanted, or like, you know, there's some character change, stuff like that. Like, you know, you work with an mm -hmm. editor, you work with an editor. But if you're being asked to like sacrifice the core of the story that you want to write, like yeah. just, it's okay to be like, am I really willing to do this? But you do, this no longer the only way to get your story out there. There are mm -hmm. other options and it's totally okay to be like, no, I think I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to stick to who I am with yeah. this one. I think that's well said. And I don't think we need to put any more words onto this podcast. I think that was We're it. We're doing good. Yeah. So if you guys have read any of these books and you had a similar experience or maybe a totally different experience, do leave them in the comments down below or leave us a, give us a, a, a an email. If you're listening on the podcast, we have a podcast uh, email in the show notes. Um, and we should also note what we, yeah. we did my TikTok. So let's do your TikTok. Oh yeah. I am uh, also a lovely jaunt on TikTok and I do still talk about books over there <laughs> in very much the same way, just in shorter snippets. So yeah, until next time. I'm Emily. And I'm Alexandra. And this has been the Novelty Podcast. Even Thank though you. we're drinking coffee today. <laughs> <laughs> Bye everybody. Bye-bye.